Hi my loves, welcome back. Today I'm going to be doing a book video for you all. It's long overdue. I'm going to be doing an April and May books for you. Haven't got my microphone at the moment, it is broken. <laughs> so if you hear a little bit more street noise, I apologise for that. Um, I did actually film an April books video ages ago. Edited it recently and just thought, I don't like this. It's happening a lot at the moment. I finish a video and then I'm like, I am not a fan of this. So um, we're refilming today with the May books. And another new thing, I want to start prioritising the order that I talk about books in. Um, so I'm gonna start talking about books I like the best or books I wanna talk about the most first as opposed to going into in the order that I read them in. Um, let me know if you like this. I think in some ways it works better and in other other ways it doesn't. Actually first, let me show you the stack, the all important stack. Um, it's a big one today because obviously it's for a couple of months worth. What? Here it comes. <laughs> it's gonna fall on me. Let's talk quickly actually before we begin also about book club. Um, everything is just a mess at the moment you guys. <laughs> Um, I am going to get back into the swing of things. I swear, getting on track with these book videos is going to be the thing I do in the second half of 2020. They're going to be uploaded at the beginning of every month, I swear. I'm really sorry for the delays and stuff. It's been quite the year so far. Um, but, so, obviously I'm going to be uploading my June books probably in the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping if I get on track with things. So that's not really gonna be enough time for you guys to join in on book club if you've got your own reading going on and all that sort of thing. So, um, book club picks that I'm gonna tell you now are gonna be for my July books video, which is gonna be coming to you at the beginning of August. And then we will be back on track, I'm hoping. Um, and I picked two books again because I wanted to pick a fiction and a non-fiction this time. So in the month of June, I've been reading a lot of black authors, obviously in light of um, recent Black Lives Matter developments. Obviously it's a movement that's been around for a good few years. We all know that it's been in the news a lot at the moment and there's been a big movement online and offline. So my June books is gonna be filled with lots of fantastic black authors. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in my June books video. But that's also influenced my book club picks. One book that I'm probably gonna read in July um, that is not my book club pick, but I feel like you should read it, but um, it's a new book and I don't usually like doing brand new books for book club just because they're obviously expensive and all of that kind of stuff and can be hard to get hold of. So um, I'm probably going to be reading The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, which has been getting glowing reviews um, and is recently published and I'm excited to read that. So I am probably going to be reading that, but separately from that, um, book club picks. I actually have neither of these in physical form at the moment, um, but I've picked Red at the Bone by Jacqueline Woodson, which I've been meaning to read for ages. And also I wanted to do a non-fiction, which is going to be Women, Race and Class by Angela Davis. I have actually never read any Angela Davis, which feels, at this point in time, like an oversight. At least I don't think I have. So, um, yes, I want to read Women, Race and Class this month or in July. Um, and I hope that you guys will do that with me. After that big, long introduction, I'm going to get into my book club picks, which I picked way, way back. I don't know what video it is in. I presume my February books, I think. I didn't get around to reading them until May for various reasons, mostly because they were here and I was in America. Um, but we've got The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa and um, The Ballad of the Sad Cafe by Carson McCullough because I wanted to do a kind of newer book and then a um, classic. So... <laughs> Let's start with The Memory Police. Um, this was originally published in Japanese in 1994 um, and Yoko Ogawa is a very established Japanese author. She's won all of the major literary prizes there but this particular book has only just been translated in the last year or couple of years and it's about this kind of small unnamed island and on this island, various concepts or objects begin to disappear. And once these things disappear, the inhabitants sort of lose all their memories of these things, um, which includes 
you know, sentimental memories that might percolate around a particular idea or object. Um, and so they begin to lose a sense of themselves. So these things that disappear can be like all sorts of random things. There's birds and boats, but also sometimes something more specific like a particular flower, like roses. It can be like a type of sweet or candy. So it can be quite kind of a vast range of things, um, including natural and sort of man-made things. But there are some people in this, on this island who manage to retain their memories and obviously they see the society around them becoming sort of dimmer and less interesting, kind of simplifying in a way. Um, now our narrator is not one of those people. Um, instead her editor is, she is a novelist, so there are sections in this book of things that she has written which are quite haunting in and of themselves. But um, she's a novelist and she tries to basically save her editor from the memory police by hiding him in her house in like one of those kind of hidden rooms, hidden spaces in the house. I think that Anne Frank was a big sort of inspiration for that part because obviously it's sort of about what happens when a totalitarian surveillance state polices what you can and can't um, remember and maybe rewrites history, how that affects people's sense of themselves, how it affects their relationships to each other, you know, and remove some of that sense of connection to other people. This can feel particularly relevant right now in discussions here about um, statues of slave owners being pulled down, people are saying that it's erasing history when really the real erasure is happening in the way we educate our citizens in um, the kind of history of colonialism and stuff like that. So that is a good example I think of how this book is still very relevant today and it doesn't have to be what you would consider a totalitarian state to have relevance in what it means to remember things and how you remember things and why remembering can be an act of rebellion. Also it's obviously relevant to lots of history and it's partially inspired by Anne Frank, that little room. So it's often described as a dystopia which I feel like lots of people like dystopian fiction and they sort of go looking for dystopian fiction um, uh, with the idea that it's going to kind of be action-packed or plot-driven um, or world-driven even, whereas this is quite a quiet um, fable of a novel. It's dreamy, it's understated, the prose is very pared back, um, sort of the character is quite, well because she keeps forgetting things, things that are important to her sense of self, she almost seems quite too level, too calm and um, reserved, but it's quite a haunting book. It's quite a slow paced book, but yeah it's quite haunting, it's quite dreamlike, um, and I found it to be very beautiful. I wasn't really sure what to make of it because, like I said, some people are disappointed with this book because it's not crazy on world building, it's not doing lots of the things that dystopian fiction is sort of thought to do these days, but it's very beautiful in its own way. You guys know I like a kind of quiet understated book anyway, it's my kind of thing. Yeah, I thought it was very affecting that it looked at loss and grief in quite a new way. But yes, it's not gonna be for everyone, I don't think. Um, if you do like something a little bit more action packed, um, this isn't gonna be for you. But I really enjoyed it and would re recommend it to you guys. I hope that you liked it. If you read it with me, um, I'm sorry if you didn't. So next we have The Ballad of the Sad Cafe by Carson McCullers. So McCullers, if you don't know, was a Southern writer, sort of of the similar um, William Faulkner generation of writers. So she's often also put into the category of Southern Gothic. She deals a lot in gro in the grotesque and she often has themes of isolation, of loneliness and the difficulty of communicating and making connections with other people, especially in sort of a destitute um, setting. So this little volume is a novella and a bunch of um, her other short stories which I just discovered the other day when I was writing my review that Wunderkind, um, which is one of the stories she wrote when she was just 17, and it's fantastic. So the main novella is about a woman named Miss Amelia. She is kind of a 
large, imposing woman who um, sort of take, takes advantage of her local resident. She's got a bit more money than everyone else um, in the town. And she sort of finds herself um, in, a, in a kind of love triangle with her ex-husband and like a distant cousin of hers. And McCullers really uses the grotesque to explore um, androgyny and queerness and gender um, and she's also looking like I said at isolation at loneliness at what it means to love and not be loved back um, and it's very moving um, her prose is just really beautiful I just feel like I can't even describe it um, it's like lyrical and poetic but also it's got that yeah southern gothic edge and it's also got a sense of realism as well. And she really manages to do a lot in very few words. And she is a master at creating atmosphere as well. Um, one thing I sort of don't know about. I remember I was writing, I think, an essay on her book, um, The Member of the Wedding at Uni. And I remember coming across um, just some discussion of her... Um, depiction of disability in this book and I can't for the life of me remember what that essay said um, but I do I was kind of aware of it going into this novella and I do think there will be aspects of ableism um, I think in a lot of writing of this um, era there's going to be those sort of questionable moments where they don't kind of come up to contemporary standards so that's just something to be aware of, I think. But yes, that's The Ballad of the Sad Cafe. I like McCullough because I feel like there were so few female authors doing this, um, especially female authors exploring sort of queerness and gender. So I always appreciate her, her writing. Um, and I also just find it very beautiful. So next we're gonna talk about Lent, which was a huge, surprise for me how much I liked this book in fact loved this book it's one of those books that's kind of been haunting me after the fact and I've been thinking about it a lot and I actually just recently made my mum read it and she really enjoyed it as well I'm really drawn to historical fiction at the moment because um of Wolf Hall I think of how much I enjoyed Wolf Hall um I am going to read Bring Up the Bodies I think next month which I'm very excited about I've kind of been putting it off because I want to spread out the process. But this is a kind of historical fiction and speculative fiction mashup, which I love, and it's something that's not rarely done, but when it is done well, I absolutely love it. Um, it's by, because I think Joe Walton is actually um, more often a science fiction author. So Lent is about Girolamo Savonarola, who was a real historical figure. He was a monk in 15th century Florence, and um, at one stage he sort of um, held sway over the whole of Florence so he's kind of like famous for that famous for sort of defying the Pope and for essentially being sort of a precursor to the Reformation he had those kinds of views he considered himself a prophet he did a lot of prophesying I don't know actually if he did this in real life he claimed he could ban demons or he claims it at least in this book and basically what Walton does is she gives Girolamo all the sort of powers that he was said to have had. So he can accurately prophesy, he can he can ban demons, he can see demons. There's this really um, amazing opening scene where this convent is like covered in demons, like really grotesque demons, and the two monks either side of them, him can't see them. And he's just there like staring at all of these grotesque beings so and he can ban them basically he can banish them back to hell what I love about this book is that it brings a sense of mysticism um, to Christianity it brings that kind of magical magical realism element to Christianity and to Western culture and Florence and Western history um, in a way that's not often done you know it's often done um, to other cultures but not necessarily to Western culture so I like that she kind of brought in some of that um, it's quite an interesting combination and to my knowledge I've not read anything like it before um, it's served up in really like unfussy prose and it really evokes Florence but through the lens of Girolamo so um, 
she doesn't do a lot of description she just kind of manages to build it through atmosphere through character um, her characters were great like there was a lot of love going into the characters you could just tell and a lot of it is it's obviously about theology and time and history and she handles all the theology really really well but it's also got lots of elements of like friendship and love and just what it means to be a human basically um which i loved so yeah it completely surprised me how much i enjoyed this it's a very unique novel i think and i want to read everything else that she's written um but yeah if you think a novel about a 15th century monk from florence um who has special powers doesn't sound like your kind of thing i recommend you try giving this a try anyway um and there are some more fantastical elements and maybe even a twist that I'm not telling you guys about because I want you to read it and be surprised but there's more going on than meets the eye. Okay guys, I may have just moved significantly because <laughs> as usual when I've done these videos, either the memory card or the battery goes and then I thought that the camera had deleted half an hour's worth of footage and I was going to scream but it turns out it didn't so sorry. Um, right, moving on to Homegoing by Yag Yassi, um, which I listened to, which I actually think I would have been better off reading instead of listening to. Um, I feel like I say that a lot, but right now I'm listening to a really good book um, called Vita Nostra. So I do pick some good audiobooks sometimes, but um, I do think this one probably works a little better in reading form because... Um, it covers a lot of ground. So this is about two sisters, um, Effia and Essie, who are living in 18th century Ghana, or what is now Ghana. And one of those sisters is sold into slavery and one of them um, becomes a slave trader's wife, is married off basically to a white man. So what this book does is it sort of switches between the two lineages um, across the next like 300 years. Um, so we've got like one of Effia's descendants, then one of Essie's descendants, then one of Effia's descendants, and obviously um, the lineages more or less live out their lives, one in Ghana and one um, in the US. So this book has a panoramic view of lots of elements of black diasporic life. Um, obviously a lot of it is absolutely heart-wrenching. So in terms of in Ghana you've got the Asante and Fante people's sort of dealings with white colonialists um, and there's lots going on there historically that I think a lot of people wouldn't be aware of. Over on the US side you've got life on plantations and then you've got the sort of great northward migration and um, the family line ends up in New York in Harlem so it's got a huge scope and lots of people really really love this book the prose is really accomplished it's Gassi's debut novel she's actually got one coming out this year I think which I am excited to read and I particularly think the sort of first few chapters are really really strong and I think if you're unfamiliar with a lot of that history um, this might be a good sort of fictional place to start obviously we should all be reading non-fiction as well for a lot of people it's not as digestible so I think um, this might be a really nice introduction for a lot of people to lots of important parts of black history. I do think because of the structure of this book, it's actually quite short considering how, um, how much it covers. The structure of this book sort of is a little bit too choppy for me. Um, each of the chapters sort of has to stand alone because, um, you're switching generation, you're switching place between every chapter. Um, and you're switching main character essentially every single chapter. So um, a lot of that sort of through line, even though you know it's a part of a lineage, was lost for me. It was more driven by the sort of history element um, than it was by the characters themselves, which when you're reading a novel, it can be a little bit difficult, especially if you're listening to it. So that was kind of my point is that listening to it was more confusing, I think, because you don't get that idea of when the chapter, when the next chapter comes um, and some of the paragraph breaks. You don't get the sort of important details that remind you of what's just come before in the character's life and you don't get the all-important family tree 
uh, which is useful, I would imagine it would be useful to flip back to. So I feel like my reading was possibly marred a little bit by listening to it. I do think when I have a book like this, which spans such a long period of time, I want it to be longer. I want to follow the characters for more than a chapter. Um, and obviously there's chapters that are going to kind of, you're going to connect with the character a little bit more than any others. So yes, but I really, really appreciate um, what Gyasi is doing in this novel. Um, and I do think it would be a really good intro to lots of things um, for a lot of people because there's a lot of surprising history in here, I think. I actually read, though, this interesting um, review which particularly looks at the American sections because I do think she writes the um, Ghanaian sections better. But in general, it's really good. Shows a lot of promise for a debut novel. Like, it's crazy how much this covers and I will be reading her next work. Next we have yet another Jeff Vandermeer. You guys are probably immensely bored of me talking about Jeff Vandermeer now, but I'm going to do it regardless. Um, this is Born. Uh, I'm going to describe it to you and you're going to be like, oh, what the fuck? So basically this is set in some post-apocalyptic city um, which is essentially ruled by an immense bioengineered bear called Maud who can actually fly, um, and he just kind of flies around this city terrorising everyone, essentially. Um, and the reason the city is in ruins is because of the company, the ominous of the company, um, who was doing all this kind of bioengineering. And our protagonist, Rachel, um, whilst Maud is sleeping, sort of climbs up onto him. He gets a lot of scavengers because he flies around the city and picks up various things in his fur um, and she climbs onto him to look for stuff and she finds this small kind of sea creaturely looking thing and she takes it home despite her partner's warnings um, she kind of raises this strange creature um, who obviously might not be entirely natural himself. So it sounds pretty weird and I was thinking am I going to enjoy this as much as I enjoyed Southern Reach because at least in Southern, with Southern Reach there's sort of some touchstones of n normalcy uh, but this one sort of lets go of all of those things and does something new. It's part of a new series of his. Um, the second one's actually out called Dead Astronauts getting it for my birthday. Like his other novels, this is so, so layered. It's obviously about biotech and that sort of thing. It's about personhood and what it means to be a person. It's about space and place um, because the protagonist has a very specific relationship to the home that she shares with her partner, to the city and also to her original home. She um, is from an island in the South Pacific. Um, Rachel's obviously a little bit of an unreliable narrator, there's lots of uncanny and strange things going on in the city and uh, through Raising Bourne but also there's a lot of funny and light elements in those moments as well. So about her relationship to her partner and sometimes you wonder whether um, despite these two kind of crazy creatures in Maud and Bourne is actually really about her relationship to her partner Wick. So yes, there's lots happening, as always, in this book um, in a very sort of readable and entertaining way. Rachel is a very sort of charismatic protagonist, much like the biologist. You sort of immediately get drawn into her voice. So, yes, I really, really enjoyed this um, and I thought it was really clever, as always. And I will keep reading Vandermeer because I just think that he is one of my favourite authors now. So speaking of Vandermeer, this is a book I discovered through his Twitter. He, I think he knows the author. He recommended it and so I picked it up and I'm very pleased that I did um, because I'm not sure I would have discovered it by myself. It was published by an uh, independent publisher which I think is like a collective of authors um, called FC2. So yeah, I'm not sure I would have discovered it on my own so I'm very pleased that I did. Um, and it's called The Book of Cain and Margaret and it's by Kik Araki Kawaguchi um, and it is about uh, Cain and Margaret who are two people living in a Japanese internment camp in the US during World War II which um, I feel like in the back of my mind I've read stuff about in Japanese internment camps before but I'd never really 
like fully come to realize what that meant um and i was quite shocked by the history of it so this book um each chapter is sort of a different riff on Cain and margaret or a different version or a different iteration of their lives like sometimes they are an old couple who've been together for decades sometimes they're courting each other sometimes Cain is a cricket sometimes Cain is miniature sometimes he has wings sometimes margaret is a healer or an artist or an athlete um, so basically there's just loads of different sort of versions of them and their lives um, in the camp sometimes it focuses just on one of them and not both of them um, so yeah there's lots to love it's very kind of whimsical even though it's addressing something obviously like devastatingly sad um, but I think the point of each of the chapters is that Kane and Margaret are um, subverting the boundaries of the camp and sort of um, undermining the power structures that work through whatever it is that they're doing. So yes, like I say, it's quite whimsical. It's sort of about nature. It features quite a lot of like Japanese cultural elements, which I really appreciated and enjoyed, obviously. And the prose is very kind of delicate and lyrical and beautiful, and also quite funny a lot of the time. And the little chapters are very short, sometimes as you can see it's just like a page, sometimes they're a little bit longer. Um, and so it's a really nice thing to read, I think at the moment when your concentration is low. <laughs> um, I assume everyone's concentration is as low as mine. Because you can sort of delve in and there is a through line but it's also you can sort of read a few chapters and sort of enjoy the imagery, enjoy the feeling and the atmosphere but yeah I just thought it was a really it's just a really lovely book um, despite the subject matter and it's really about little rebellions and little things you can do to undermine power schemes I really really appreciated it it's a lot of natural elements as well you guys kind of love a little bit of nature in there I would highly highly recommend this one okay next up I went in May on a sort of Ursula K Le Guin journey um, through the first of her Hainish novels. So we've got um, the first three all in this volume which is Rakanan's World, Planet of Exile and City of Illusions and then we've got Left Hand, The Left Hand of Darkness which is obviously very famous and sort of canonical um, both in and outside of speculative fiction. So there's a lot to cover here I'm kind of going to talk about them all together because I feel like that is the most useful thing to do even though they are separate books. So they're science fiction novels, um, The Hainish Cycle, and um, there's more books in The Hainish Cycle. Um, I know that Le Guin herself said that she didn't, doesn't consider it a cycle but they're all kind of set in this Hainish universe and basically it's about a universe in which there are hundreds of worlds who um, all have human beings on them and these are all descendants of a civilization called Hain, including us on Earth, the Terrans, um, so Earth does feature, and all the human beings are obviously slightly different, not just socioculturally, but also sometimes physiologically and biologically. It, that allows Le Guin to sort of um, compare them, to be imaginative in um, thinking about alternative ways of being and the first three novels um, feature what's called the League of All Worlds and essentially this league is trying to establish diplomatic relations between um, these worlds of human beings um, long long after the kind of Hainish population of all of these worlds um, so they're quite fable-like I discovered that the word for fable-like the other day is fabula which I don't like. There's something about that word which I really just don't think gets across what I'm trying to say. But they're, they're like fables, they're sort of fairy tale like, um, which is quite interesting for like science fiction interstellar sort of works. Um, lots of natural themes, and there's all. So basically, these first three books were actually Le Guin's first three published books in general. So you can see her finding her feet in these books, you can see her sort of establishing where her interests lie um, and you guys may remember I read the first, 
the Earthsea Quartet, so the first Earthsea books last year and absolutely loved them. I think A Wizard of Earthsea came before this one, but um, these came first. So you can see where she's sort of finding her feet um, in these books. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't read them um, in and of themselves because they're good, but I sort of found them valuable as part of Le Guin's like, larger body of work. And I think um, she, again, is fast becoming one of my favourite authors. So I just want to read everything by her. So I found um, it interesting to read those early books also for that reason. But yeah, they're quite old fashioned in their own way. You know, they're, they were written in the um, 60s. So I think something I've discovered about myself is I like, if I'm gonna have like, like a space-based science fiction book. I want it to be up to the minute, I want to learn all sorts of science stuff, um, a bit like the Three Body Problem um, series. That's kind of my preference if I'm going to read something spacey. These kind of old-fashioned space novels are less, just less my kind of thing and I think a lot of, for me, a lot of Le Guin's um, themes and ideas work better in a fantasy setting just because it's a little bit more timeless. It just feels a little bit more natural and a little bit less like specifically like anthropological and I learned that from Dune as well but these novels are so much better than Dune okay so much better but I can see there's lots of groundbreaking stuff going on in these books in terms of sci-fi and her world are really fully realized like they really feel like they continue between novels um, and you're just not there to witness it um, I have yet to come across an author that does that quite so well. Um, she has, yeah, she's got beautiful language as well. And lots of her novels are about the sort of the power of love and friendship and um, what it means to make connections across like modes of being, as well as exploring different ways of being and language and um, ideas about balance and equilibrium. In terms of if you're a contemporary sci-fi lover and you go back and read these I think they're gonna feel a little bit stilted, they're gonna feel a little bit short um, and rushed therefore but they are sort of fairy tale like like I said so they're kind of they're they're doing something else I think and the world building is there but it's just very different to what you might expect. So I did want to speak kind of about The Left Hand of Darkness separately though because it's quite different from the others, it feels markedly different. Um, she's already sort of maturing as a writer, um, it's first person so it feels different as well because there's that sort of voice like that you're listening to as the reader. Um, so obviously this is a classic and it won the Hugo Award, it won the Nebula Award, and that's because it, I think it was quite unusual for its time. So essentially in this book, um, Genli is a Terran, he's an earthling, <laughs> and he goes um, on behalf of the Ecumen, which is essentially performing the same function as the League of All Worlds, um, to a planet called Gethin, which he's supposed to be kind of... Um, establishing relations with essentially and asking them to join in um, with the ecumen and share resources and knowledge and all that sort of stuff. So on this world um, the inhabitants do not have a fixed gender or even um, I think from what I remember um, they don't have a fixed sex either um, and every now and then I think there is a specific I think it is like 28 every 28 days or something the inhabitants enter Kema which um, is essentially like a mating period based on your chosen Kema partner you take on the sex characteristics of either male or female in order to mate um, and then you'd come out of that again you can be male one time and female the next you don't have a particular preference as to which um, sex characteristics you take on and then um, it's sort of I think based on sort of the timing your partner the kind of specific instance it might change every time so this is very much a thought experiment kind of book and Le Guin was trying to think through what would happen if you remove gender from the equation but obviously <laughs> this whole book is about gender um, in lots of ways it's not literally just about gender but it is in lots of ways it informs 
so much of what's going on. Obviously, by contemporary standards, this book doesn't really go far enough, and Le Guin absolutely acknowledged this in the years following the publication, and she acknowledged acknowledges that she should have been braver, that there were lots of things that she would do now that she wouldn't have done then. Um, for example, she uses male pronouns throughout for all of the characters, which is sad because you just think, no, <laughs> so much potential here for such a like, fantastic feminist reading, a fantastic queer reading. But she does disappoint on lots of levels, I think, with that. There's a bit of latent, um, internalised misogyny, um, latent homophobia, which I think Le Guin kind of came to understand. And that's something I really appreciate about her work, actually. It happens so rarely, I think, that an author would say, yeah, actually, I would do that differently now. Because she did it with Earthsea as well. The first three books were quite male focused and then she sort of rewrites the next books um, trying to put women back in the forefront of the story and the sort of world. So there's lots and lots and lots to think through here. I feel like it was a completely different book to what I was expecting it to be. But yeah, so essentially storyline based, in the first half Genli's trying to convince this world to become part of the Ecumen and in the second half he and his sort of most um, avid supporter within the sort of government um, end up being banished for various reasons. Don't think I'm doing too many spoilers here, it has been out for decades. Um, and they end up sort of travelling across this vast swathe of ice, um, which is sort of the image that I think most people um, associate with this book is that journey. And I particularly like the second half because I think it just worked better. Um, there was less of the bureaucracy sort of element and more of that sort of vast landscape that I love so much. And yeah, the second half is really beautiful, very moving, and Genli and Estraven come to sort of understand each other and understand that they're different but that they still have a really strong connection and despite their sort of differences, obviously the main one being the way they see gender, um, which informs the way they see the world. So yes, that is The Left Hand of Darkness. An interesting read. Um, like I said, not what I was expecting at all. Next up we have a book I don't have, which is How Much of These Hills is Gold by C. Pam Zhang, which is about two um, orphans. They are the children of Chinese immigrants making their way across the American West during the 19th century. And this book has really got this very striking prose, it's very lyrical and poetic, it's really evoking um, that dryness, that desertness of the American West. Obviously the author is exploring what it means to be um, non-white, what it means to be Chinese um, or look Chinese in the West at this time. And also this is a debut novel, so again it shows so much promise in the prose style. Um, I'll definitely be reading more of her work. This is one of those books which I'm tempted to say that it's all style, no substance. And I think it's doing more to kind of show or demonstrate its literariness than it is um, in kind of doing a little bit more exploration of its themes um, or kind of establishing a really strong plot. Um, the ending particularly was spectacularly strange, sometimes sort of overly symbolic at the expense of that plot, of that characterisation that it sort of needed um, and I felt was lacking. So it sort of just felt a little bit, um, like I said, more style than substance. Um, and I think when you have something that's so rich in symbols and symbolism, um, but it has less sort of grounding and basis um, in the rest of the elements of the book. It's easy for those things to get really mixed up, like I think at times some of the symbolism about gender and stuff was just getting a bit confused um, because there was so much imagery and stuff going on. But that, yeah, that was just my sense that something, it was just too much I think um, on quite a thin, thin plot. But 
um, like I said, I will definitely be reading more. Next we have this trilogy, the, I think it's called the Last 100 Years trilogy or something slightly ridiculous like that, um, by Jane Smiley, which has lots of the markers of Smiley novels that I like. So it is about one family over the course of 100 years from um, 1920 through to 2019 um, and Smiley sort of writes into the future a little bit because I think this last book was published in 2015 so it's interesting to see her interpretation of what the fallout from the 2016 election would be and we are following a farming family from Iowa especially the first novel is quite slow um, especially when they're all on the farm they haven't kind of dispersed across the country yet and Smiley does an incredible job at sort of making people grow up before your eyes in a very very believable way it's so hard to create characters from birth to adulthood, give them all the sort of flaws and foibles that a human being would have in a very believable way and I think Smiley does that amazingly well. Then as we get onto the middle book which is my favourite book, you get a little bit more history um, because the characters are beginning to disperse and sort of take part in um, American, American life, whatever that is, and yes you're getting, I think in the middle novel there's a really great balance of like character-led storylines and some of that history, some of that politics. Obviously over the course of the three novels she's trying to give a kind of history of the US over that hundred years. Now obviously it's from a very specific standpoint, a standpoint of a white family for instance, it's very specific in that way. But yeah, she's just trying to give you lots of that content. In the middle book the balance is great and it was definitely my favourite and I really enjoyed reading it. Um, and then in the final book things just went awry it just, they just went awry and I was so sad because I enjoyed the first two books I like that kind of slow build family drama plus a little bit of history um quiet vibe um that Smiley is so good at but yeah the last book was kind of a huge disappointment it was too long we were spending lots of time with the part of the family that I didn't really like. Um, there was, by the time you get to this point as well, like everyone's dying in quick succession, which just takes away some of the poignancy from some of those moments that were so good in some of the early books. And really, um, one of the key things that was wrong was that really the balance was off on the kind of history versus family stuff. So the storylines just got too and too unbelievably involved in the historical parts and yeah just the balance seemed off it no longer felt driven by the characters themselves but instead just by um wanting to get particular things across um and some of the environmental things so she in she introduces a kind of element of um, environmental crisis which is very much appreciated and very important but it just wasn't quite realised right. That was sad because I feel like I was reading those books for ages and it's sad when something doesn't end how you want how you want it to or sort of with the same level of um, love. Next I have The Dutch House which is another listen of mine. Tom Hanks actually narrates this one but again I think I would have been better off reading this one instead of listening to it partially because and I know this is going to be a really unpopular opinion but um, Tom Hanks reads this book so weirdly can someone else even just listen to a sample of this and tell me that he does not read this it with such strange intonation um, <laughs> it really sort of confused me um, and made listening to it a kind of slightly stranger experience but anyway this is The Dutch House by Anne Patchett um, obviously I read Bel Canto earlier this year and I liked Bel Canto in lots of ways but in other ways I was a bit disappointed in it and I sort of feel <laughs> I sort of feel that this book was good but it wasn't particularly memorable for me um, it's about a boy called Danny who is growing up in Philadelphia in sort of a, the post-World War II world and his dad has made a lot of money and property 
become a bit of a tycoon and he buys this beautiful house, the Dutch house, which is the best bit apart about the novel completely. Um, I want to live there. The description is so much. I want to see it. I want to visit it. I want to live there. And essentially his mother sort of runs off and disappears. He and his sister are subject to this new stepmother who doesn't like them very much and ends up sort of disinheriting them. Um, so it's kind of a classic story in lots of ways. Um, and it's about the kind of preceding um, decades of his life and his and his sister's life who he's very close to and um, their relationship and their relationship to the house and coming coming to terms with what happened in their childhoods and it's also kind of a very I think it's you could class it as a historical novel because it's really about um, that part of the US um, at that time as well um, and just like a bel canto patches prose is very accomplished it's very smooth um, it's got all the markers of good american fiction but i know that lots of people have a problem with danny because he's not very likable and that is certainly true i don't necessarily mind unlikable narrators like that but yes i think a lot of this was lost in listening to it because when i'm reading i like all those little mundane details i like the things that build the world um in a sort of quiet way but when you're listening to it it kind of comes across as boring so um and especially with tom hanks's weird reading the things i think i would have enjoyed on the page didn't necessarily um enjoy in listening to it but yes i think if that sounds like your kind of thing then you'll probably enjoy this book okay also next we've got hidden valley road which is a non-fiction book it's um about schizophrenia so it's about a family also in that kind of post world war ii era um and they had 12 children uh six of whom ended up having schizophrenia essentially it's about them and it's also about their kind of contributions to the study of the disease as well and the sort of nature versus nurture debate and all of that sort of stuff and also um, how to medicate and how to treat. So it's a good contemporary history of the disease I thought um, and an interesting story but I did think it was a bit light-footed in lots of areas. Um, it sort of briefly mentions how pharmaceutical companies don't um, put money into medications that could be better for various reasons and um, there's only kind of a fleeting look at neurodiversity arguments and also you know it's quite it's obviously from a very specific standpoint so it's not giving you like a very full picture of schizophrenia or how it's treated or perceived by society because it's from that kind of white middle class standpoint um in terms of because it comes because the story is coming from the family um which i guess just makes it specific um but it doesn't make it a like an amazing history of the disease so Yes, there's an element of sort of privilege there. It has amazing reviews on Goodreads. I had a look the other day and I was like, what is happening? Next we have Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melcourt, which is um, a translate piece of translated fiction. Um, the author is Mexican and this was originally written in Spanish. Um, it is about um, life in uh, the village of La Matosa, which is in Mexico, and it follows a cast of characters, most of whom are um, poverty-stricken and living in a very kind of violent world. And it focuses particularly around the murder of a tra local transgender woman um, who is known locally as the witch. And essentially, each chapter there's a new character and um, Melkor sort of inhabits their voice in a, I think it's a free indirect style, it's not first person and sort of we come to discover how this woman, this woman was murdered um, which is obviously deeply tragic in and of itself but on top of that this novel is so brutal and violent I think possibly one of the most violent novels I've ever read um, it is so intense, it needs a huge trigger warning on it. I think obviously what Melkor is doing in this novel is she's trying to sort of show that living in poverty 
can make you subject to more violence and also there's not a lot of um, alternatives offered to the characters in the book um, that would allow them to escape like a kind of cyclical violent process um, it's also looking at obviously gender and the violence directed particularly at women, particularly at transgender women, what it means to live in such a misogynistic world, not just for the women, but also for the men who are struggling with their masculinity or their sexuality. So I can sort of see what Melkor is trying to do, but I think it is really lost in execution and lots of people really like this book or at least appreciate it. I don't think it's possible to like it because it is so um, horrific in so many ways. I think it's been shortlisted for the International Booker and all sorts but I really think that Melkor actually does a disservice to her characters and to her themes by making this such a kind of shock factor book. Um, I think it's something that's different for every reader. What, Where the line is drawn as to when something just becomes a little bit almost fetish fetishistic um, and trauma porn where it just becomes too much and I think in this book it is too much and for a long time I was like oh maybe I'm just being a little bit of a prude or I just like the point of the novel is to shock you and to hurt you and but I do just think at the end of the day that it's just not, it's just doing a disservice to its characters and the lives on which its characters are based. Um, I finally read this Goodreads review which sort of articulated everything that I want. I wanted to say and that I hadn't really been able to articulate even to myself and like there's no hope here, there's no um, warm moments which I sometimes actually think you need even in books which are about tragedy, just to give a sort of baseline so you can understand the depth of the problem. And something I particularly thought was a problem is that we never hear the witch's perspective and instead we just see her being brutalised. And I think that's pretty bad as well. And I just don't think it's enough these days to just do the shock thing and to just throw a bunch of really horrific things and swear words into a book. Um, I just, yeah, I just can't get behind it and I, yeah, didn't enjoy it at all. So I definitely wouldn't recommend this one and I also just think it's it's so heavy. So yes, I also thought the translation was strange because um, the translator uses Britishisms um, because obviously a lot of it must be quite colloquial in Spanish and I think she should have either gone more kind of for a, Americanisms um, because obviously Mexico and America are a little bit closer and probably share a little bit more vocab or just left them in the Spanish or something. I thought it was it really took me out of the sort of moment with um, the translation. So all in all not a good reading experience for me and I think there's definitely better books out there that you could be reading um, that explore for example transgender life um, without doing this. Okay, final book. Um, as you can see, we're getting into books I really didn't like. Um, this is The Gallows Pole by Benjamin Myers. Really wanted to like this one. I actually found out about this book via Lizzie Hadfield or Shot from the Street. She is lovely and I always like to note down what she's reading. Um, and she read this book and I'd never even heard of it. So I was like, I'm definitely gonna pick that up. I also just love the cover super cool. It's about um, a guy called David Hartley, it's historical fiction, about a guy called David Hartley who really existed. He was part of a gang called the Cragvale Coiners during 18th century England. He lived around um, West Yorkshire, in fact it is pretty much where Zach's family lives so I was quite familiar with lots of the places so um, I was particularly excited to read this book because of that. I know that Lizzie's also sort of from around there so I can kind of see why she was drawn to this book and why I was drawn to this book. By the way Lizzie has lots of fantastic recommendations. She didn't rave about this book I just thought oh that sounds interesting but I did not like it unfortunately. Um, so essentially the Cragvale Vale coiners, wow I can't speak, um, were making counterfeit coins um, it was called clipping at the time, forging 
the coins. Essentially this book is about how David Hartley came, comes to be caught for doing this and hung, um, hence why it's called The Gallows Pole. I'm not spoiling anything there because it's sort of um, established from the outset. So apparently this book is forensically assembled from historical accounts and legal documents, which is fine. I'm sure lots of historical fiction is. I also thought that this was very much an all style, no substance book. So it has, again, it has quite poetic language, but it's also quite earthy, quite meaty. And I found the writing really promising at the beginning, but I just didn't find it enjoyable or gripping. I couldn't stay interested in it. I think because the plot is actually quite thin on the ground and it has these sort of dramatic cinematic scenes, but they don't, I don't know what purpose they serve. They, it seems to be kind of a little bit repetitive, in fact very repetitive, particularly when it comes to um, David Hartley being of the land and the land being of David Hartley and these men being of the land and they're made up of the soil of the land. Like that sort of imagery was repeated so much. I was like, I get it. Um, there's also a second narrative going on, which is like a first person from the point of view of David Hartley, who is in, who is in jail. And it's written in like um, phonetically spelled English, um, which is just initially very difficult to read and then you sort of get into it. But um, I didn't know what the point of that was. It didn't seem to be adding anything at all. It doesn't seem to advance the plot apart from him occasionally saying it was like this and it being slightly different in the plot, but only slightly. Um, and I just didn't know what the relationship between the two things was. And I think, again, it was just trying to be a little bit more literary than it was sort of doing what novels do best. I also just thought the depiction of women was bad. Um, we get introduced to David's wife at the beginning, but essentially getting violated. Um, and I was like, right, she's going to be a main character here. She's going to drive the plot. She's going to speak lots. She's going to do something. And then she never does. And then I was hoping for a kind of victory for her at the end. Um, but it's more of a victory really for her son, for David's son as well. Um, at the end. So I was really disappointed by that element and I don't see why she was introduced at all if that was just going to be the role. So yes that was me in the gallows pile. I wish I'd loved it more because I just I recognised some of the places and I was like oh this is going to be fun but it wasn't and like I said I'm into my historical fiction at the minute but sadly I did not love it. I don't think I would be returning to Myers's work. So that is everything you guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's super long. I hope I didn't talk too much. Um, my back is killing me so I'm gonna go and my throat. So I'm gonna go and drink something. Um, but thank you guys for watching today. I'll see you soon um, for my June books as well. Should be a good one.